All right, today we're picking it up where we left off in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 7 is where we're picking it up. Exodus chapter 32, we'll pick it up in verse 7, but let me read verses 11 through 14 right now. And I will admit that this week I have wrestled with this sermon like Jacob wrestled with that angel. Day and night, night and day, this sermon has been a battle, and I will be relieved to be rid of it when I am done, but I also trust that God will bless the preaching of his word. Um, Exodus chapter 32, verses 11 through 14 is what I want to read, and I'm hoping to share more of the fruit of my labor, not the sweat of my labor, as I teach this passage. I know way too much about it at this point. My brain is overwhelmed with information, so I'm hoping to teach it in a way to where you don't feel overwhelmed with information. You can pray for me right now as we read. Exodus chapter 32, verses 11 and following. Now watch this. It says, But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say, With evil intent did he bring them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and relent from this disaster against your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised I will give to your offspring and they shall inherit it forever and the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken of bringing on his people. Amen. This is obviously Moses interceding for the Israelites. So the title for this sermon, it says the golden calf because we're continuing the golden calf incident. But the title I have in my notes for this sermon is the intercession of of Moses, the intercession of Moses, and uh, man, this is, uh, this is quite the passage. We remember last week that the Israelites had shaped a golden calf and had worshipped it as an idol, and that was really, really bad. Total failure, a breach of the first two of the Ten Commandments, and maybe the most important commandments of the Ten Commandments, they had worshipped a calf and danced around it. It says in verse 6 of Exodus 32, they got up to play, which means that great immorality broke out after them worshipping this golden calf. They had utterly failed. Everybody say failed. They had utterly failed. The Israelites had fallen totally on their face. And I know that none of you can relate to that at all. And I certainly can. I don't know about you, but I can't relate to that. I've never failed before in my life. Uh, but they had, and I feel sorry for them, because they have totally fallen on their face. And the question is, what do we do when we fail? What do we do when we are weak? What do we do when we are overwhelmed by life? What do we do when we've been abused? What do we do when we've been attacked by the enemy from the outside of our life? We've been attacked from the inside. What do we do when our own nature lets us down? What do we do when we make dumb decisions even though we know I'm smarter than that? Where do we go? Where do we go when we want results and we feel like we need results right now? The Israelites had chosen what they wanted to do. They wanted to go to an idol. They wanted to go to something they could see. They wanted to go to a superstitious idea. 
They built the golden calf because they felt their weakness. They built the golden calf because they didn't want to be in the wilderness anymore. They built the golden calf because their life had been full of slavery and liberation and the stress of going through the Red Sea, and they were ready to get to the promised land. They were impatient, and what they chose to do in their weakness was they went to an idol. What do we do? And the simple answer is, is what we need to do is we need to go to Jesus Christ as our intercessor. Moses interceding for the Israelites in the presence of Yahweh is a great picture of Jesus Christ, the greater than Moses who intercedes for us in our weakness, in our failure, and in our sin. The Bible tells us over and over again, do not trust in idols. Do not trust in the world's solutions. Go to Christ. Confess your weakness. There's a great New Testament passage, and I don't have a slide for it, but I thought of it this morning while I was getting dressed. It's in 1 John. It's in the New Testament. If you have a Bible, go there with me. 1 John chapter 1. In our weakness... In our sin, we need to go to Jesus who intercedes for us. 1 John chapter 1, and we'll pick it up in verse 8. I just felt led to read these verses to you. Even though it adds more content to our sermon, I'm hoping it helps us this morning. I'm praying that it does. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and following. The Apostle John, the great apostle of love, by the way, no more loving pastor than John. No pastor has ever matched the pastoral love of the Apostle John. 1 John 1, verse 8, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. And you do see that, right? Like, Like, no one can... Hey, listen, if you're coming to church this morning, you're like, I don't feel worthy to go to church, join the crowd amen nobody's walked into this into this church building go you know i should be here more than other people if you say this morning i am without sin you are a liar stop lying to yourself stop lying to others stop lying to god john the loving apostle says i want to love you well and pastor you well in church you cannot say that you are without sin So what do you do if you're stuck with this sin? He says in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Once again, he says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. In other words, if you and I say that we are not with sin, not only are we a liar, we make God out to be a liar. We're saying, God, you're a liar calling us all sinners like that, being all negative and dark with your, with your, with your message from the Bible that we need so much help. God, you're a liar because I don't need as much help as you say I do. John says, don't do that. God is not a liar. Then he says, look at chapter 2, verse 1. Now watch this, unbelievable verse. It's almost, it's unfortunate there's a chapter break there. By the way, the chapter breaks are not inspired. The words are. But he says in verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. In other words, that you might start to overcome sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. That is good news, man. We got an advocate. You're like, what's an advocate? An advocate is a defense attorney. I grew up, my dad was a defense attorney, criminal defense attorney. He worked at a a law firm in Oklahoma City called Kerr, Irvine, and Rhodes. He He was a criminal defense attorney. He was an advocate, and sometimes he was an advocate for guilty people. Well, the greatest criminal defense attorney in the history of eternity is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And there's no use in us going before God's court and trying to defend ourselves. That would be unsmart. No, that's not a word. 
That almost sounded like Donald Trump or something, unsmart. Um, that would be foolish for us to try to defend ourselves in the court of God's law. We need a defense attorney, and there's only one defense attorney who is sufficient for our case as guilty sinners. That is Jesus Christ our Lord. So we've already learned from Exodus, Jesus is our high priest, amen? He is our tabernacle. And just like Moses interceding and saying, do not destroy your people. Don't burn them up with your wrath. Moses stands and intercedes for the Israelites who have worshipped the golden calf. Jesus Christ intercedes for us. What do we do when we're weak? What do we do when we are in sin? What do we do when we're trapped? We go to Jesus who intercedes for us. That means that we believe in the person of Jesus, the means of Jesus, the word of Jesus. We do not believe in superstitious solutions. We don't believe in good luck or bad luck. We believe in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in knocking on the wood. Well, knocking on wood, I'll live longer. We say, Jesus, help me live longer. Can I get an amen? We don't believe in dirty socks that we wore when the Green Bay Packers last won their Super Bowl many, many years ago. Okay, I'll let you wear them. But don't trust in it. We trust in Jesus Christ. We don't trust in holy oil that somebody anointed far away in Israel that's suddenly been brought to America and we buy on TV and we bring it into our house and we cover ourselves in the holy oil and maybe God will then bless us. We believe in Jesus Christ. We don't believe in special cloths. We don't believe in special pictures. We don't believe in icons. We don't believe in statues. We don't believe in the Pope. We don't go to Mary for our mediation. We don't go to the saints for our mediation. Beloved, we believe in Jesus Christ. We go to no one else. I don't go to Sherry to solve my sin problem, although sometimes she would like me to. I go to Jesus Christ. You want to know the secret of a marriage? Don't look to your spouse to be your savior. Go to Jesus. That's the message of the gospel. Christians are different. We don't like, we don't go, man, if you have this special rope that's been designed just for you and you put it around your neck, you'll be more blessed by God. Beloved, you cannot be any more blessed by God in this very moment if you have Jesus Christ in your life. You don't need special cloths, you don't need special things, special socks, special shirts, you don't need good luck, you don't need bad luck, you don't need any of that, you don't need the lottery. Beloved, you are rich in Jesus Christ. He is your high priest. He is your advocate. He is your savior. He is your Lord. He is your king. What do you do when you're weak? You go to the throne of grace to your high priest. You go to Jesus Christ. And you go to him through the means he gives. What are the means of Jesus Christ? What are his instruments for blessing us? Fellowship with the church. Being together, praying with one another, studying scripture together. What are the means? Coming to church on Sunday. Opening up your heart to the word of God on Sunday. What are the means of grace? Talking to him in your prayer closet. Having a conversation with him. Believing his promises from the word of God. You don't need superstition. You need the Savior. And I had a professor. I must say. I must say. I had a professor. My professors were not perfectly infallible in seminary and unfortunately the seminary I went to has gone completely woke which I'm very disappointed about and I'm ashamed and embarrassed that they did but I had a professor and he said this he said Protestants are more Catholic than they realize Protestants are more Catholic than they realize He said, in practice, we believe in our pastors more than we do our Savior. We put our pastors up on pedestals. Protestants are just as superstitious. All this holy oil and holy water from the Jordan River. It's no different than praying to the saints. You might as well. Protestants act like Catholics when you need all kinds of other mediators between you and God, and yet the Bible says there is only one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. Listen, the only thing you need to be right with God is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You don't need a priest. You don't need a pastor. 
You don't need a confessional booth. You don't need any of that stuff. It's all superstitious. And that superstition has crept into the church. It makes a lot of, there's a lot of money to be had in it too. By the way, y'all know that superstition is a very profitable business. Hey man, the money lenders are still around. They're still dishing out stuff to make some money in the name of Christianity. It's there. And what you and I got to do is stay focused and say, Jesus and Jesus only is my Savior. This is the longest introduction to a sermon I've ever given. You're like, oh my gosh, he's going to go two hours today. I might. You know, think about Martin Luther now. You're like, uh-oh, he's going to church history. This is, this is trouble. Martin Luther, the 16th century reformer, he was a monk in the Catholic Church, overwhelmed with guilt because no matter how holy he got, no matter how religious he got, no matter how many things he got and did right, he always felt guilty before the holy God. And as a monk, he said, you know what? I want to go to Rome because in Rome, that's where I can get the blessing of God. I can be rid of my guilt. So as a monk, he gets to go to Rome, his greatest dream ever to go to Rome. And when he goes into Rome, it's filled with immorality. It's filled with filth. He's overwhelmed by it. But they had the relics. Everybody say relics. And he saw the crowds going to the relics. They went to the supposed bones of John. They waited in big lines like they were going to a roller coaster. And they said, if I can just touch the bones of the Apostle John, I'll be blessed. Martin Luther waited in that line, man. He wanted that blessing. There he was in his monk clothes with his little bald head. He's just waiting. And he got the blessing. And then he went to the steps that if you prayed on every step leading up, you could help family members get out of purgatory. So he climbed the steps and he prayed for family members. What he realized was that it was all a fraud. It was all a game. And he was the one that came to the book of Romans and he realized that the apostle Paul said that the only way to be made right with God is not through relics, but by faith alone in Christ alone. Sola fide. And he started the whole Protestant Reformation because of that one doctrine. I don't know if the Shroud of Turin is real or not. I don't care. I could care less about some blanket that supposedly has the image of Jesus and his resurrection on it. I could care less. You're not going to be any more blessed if you found that thing and touched it than if you believed in Jesus Christ. Beloved, you are blessed. Believe in nothing else, nobody else, and use no other instrument except for faith alone, in Christ alone. Through his word, stop being superstitious. You are blessed because in our weakness, Jesus intercedes for us. Well, that's my introduction. Let me see if I can say just a couple of things about this text and then we'll be done. How does Jesus and what? No, 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 no. The question is, why should I? What motivates me to keep going to Jesus for intercession? And there's several answers. I'll try to get through at least one of them today. But the first reason Moses shows us why we should go to Jesus and what motivates us to keep going to Jesus as our intercessor in times of weakness. The first reason is, is that Jesus intercedes for us with the covenant of God's grace, just like Moses intercedes for the Israelites with the covenant. Now, let me explain what I mean. Let's go to the text. Go back to Exodus chapter 32. <clears throat> Let me drink some water. <clears throat> if you guys get to clear your voice, I do too. We pick it up in verse 7, and this is God's sentence for this sin of idolatry. And of course, the sin of idolatry, the wages of sin is always death. 
And the wages of idolatry is always death and God's wrath. And that's what God's sentence is. Look at it in verse 7. And the Lord said to Moses, go down. Y'all know that song, go down, Moses. Go down, Moses. Go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Please note that he says, your people, Moses. That's like my father saying to my mother when I was growing up, he's your kid. Your people. Verse 8, they have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They have made for themselves a golden calf. They have worshipped it. They have sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. A bunch of superstitious, relic-worshipping people. Verse 9, And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. A stiff Stiff-necked, it stands for a horse that when you've got its reins and you're trying to take the reins and make it go left, it goes right. It's stiff-necked. It fights the reins. A stiff-necked horse, a stiff-necked people. They're, they refuse to be led by God. They want to be led by themselves. They refuse to let God speak into their lives. They're a stiff-necked people. Verse 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you. Then Moses intercedes. Now, guys, <clears throat> this is the verdict of God over you and your sin. God's verdict over all of us is guilt. The only thing we have contributed to our salvation is our sin. The only prerequisite to salvation is you come to a place where you say, I deserve to die. The wages of sin is death, and God looks at humanity just like he looks at the Israelites, and he says, they deserve to be consumed by my wrath. That's why only Jesus can save Moses, verse 11, says you can't do that, God. Look at verse 11. He says, you, why would you burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Now, <clears throat> God is testing Moses. This is a test of his faith. When God says, I'm going to destroy all of them, He's seeing and he's drawing out of Moses what Moses is called to believe. So a lot of people look at this passage when Moses talks God out of destroying the people of Israelites as if God is like, you know, like, like God had totally forgotten that he had made this promise, that God had totally forgotten that the Israelites were his people, that God was like, oh, I forgot that they're my people and not your people, Moses. no. God is pulling out of Moses what Moses is called to believe, and by the way, what we're called to believe. When God says, your people, look again at verse 7. He says, and the Lord said to Moses, go down to your people, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt, and they have corrupted themselves. God is testing Moses because he's saying, are these your people? Did you bring them up out of the land of Egypt? Moses says in verse 11, look at verse 11. Why does your wrath burn hot against your people whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? In other words, Moses is passing the test. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Everybody say, whoa. He's saying, wait, I know what you're doing and I know what I believe. And what I believe is this. I didn't bring them up out of Egypt. You did. They're not my people. They're your people. You can't do this because they're your people. And I know that you are not going to consume them. And why will God not consume them? Again, Moses is being tested in verse 10. Look at it again. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them. I may consume them in order that I may make a great nation of you, Moses. But look at Moses' response in verse 13. This is the covenant promise. 
Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by your own self and said, I will multiply your offspring. So what God was saying to Moses was, hey, Moses, here's the deal. They're your people. You brought them out of Egypt. I'm going to wipe them out, and I am going to make a nation out of you. And Moses says, whoa, wait a minute, man. They're not my people. They're your people. I didn't bring them out, out of Egypt. You brought them out of Egypt. And by the way, your promise was to make a great nation out of Abraham, not out of me. Do you see that? Because what did God promise? God had promised in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I won't go through there. You can go to the first sermon of this series in Exodus, and we talk about the covenant of Abraham. But God had said to Abraham, in an unconditional covenant, everybody say unconditional, unconditional covenant, God had said to Abraham, I'm going to make a great nation out of you, I promise you. My covenant with you is that I am going to make a great nation out of you, and out of that great nation, you will be a blessing to the world. This is the foundation of Jesus Christ, who Matthew 1.1 says is the son of Abraham. And God is testing Moses on his understanding of the covenant of unconditional grace. Moses is saying, you can't destroy them. They're your people. You don't want the Egyptians to think badly of your name because your name is Yahweh. And by the way, he says, you must keep your covenant promise of unconditional grace. So let me read again verse 13. This is the most important verse. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, to whom you swore by what? How did God swear to his covenant to Abraham? Say it really loud. Your own self. And said to them, I will multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven. He said that to Abraham. He said that to Isaac. He said that to Jacob. I will. And all this land that I have promised, I will give to your offspring. They shall inherit it forever. What land? The land of Israel. The land being fought over today. You want proof of the existence of God? The survival of Israel might be one of them. Can I get an amen? God swore to it, and it was an unconditional covenant. And his oath that God made was on himself. So, watch this. If you make an oath in the court of law, what do you place your hand on? You make an oath, right? And that Bible is your oath. That's the place of your oath. You say, I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help me God. God made an oath, but it was not a Bible that he based his oath on. It was his own gracious character, his sovereign gracious character that he would perform the covenant to Abraham. And Moses is saying, you can't destroy your whole nation because of idolatry, because you made a promise, and your promise was not based on the performance of your people. Your promise was based upon your own character and grace. You're like, what does that have to do with us and Jesus being our intercessor? God has made a covenant with you and me, too, in Christ. Amen? And God has said, I am going to make you righteous by faith alone and not by works, not by relics, not by the church, not by a priest, not by a pastor, not by Mary, not by the saints, not by... irreligious superstitious stuff out there I am going to save you by grace and I'm going to perform the work of the covenant myself and who performs the covenant of grace Jesus does and who is Jesus Jesus is God himself in the flesh And the father, the judge, places his hand on his beloved son and says, I promise to save them by grace and not by works. I promise on the work of my son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus accomplishes the grace and the covenant of God in our place. Therefore, in Christ, we cannot be consumed for our sins. Therefore, in Christ, there is no condemnation for those in Christ. Therefore, in Christ, there is no separation from the love of God because God performs his love for us based upon his own performance, not our religious performance. Can I get an amen? 
Now, guys, this is, this is motivating. This is motivating. That's a lot of information, so I'm going to conclude the sermon right here. Can I get an amen? Yes. You like a short sermon. You know what I'm saying? A short sermon. God's love for you is not based on you. It's based on Jesus. And if God's love for you is based on Jesus, you are more loved right now than you could ever possibly be. If God's love for you is based upon Jesus and the covenant of grace, then it means that in your worst moment as a believer, God loves you as if you were his son. Therefore, you have confidence to go to him in your failures. You have confidence to go to him and say, I confess, you are free and liberated. You don't have to worry about condemnation. You, all you got to do is just come to your loving father and say, I want to overcome sin because I want to walk in this grace. I don't want to waste it. I want to overcome idolatry. I want to overcome my weaknesses. I want to overcome my loneliness. I want to overcome my abuse. I want to overcome the things that I need healing from. Because of Jesus, you can boldly go to the throne of grace in your time of need and find help because God's love for you is based on Jesus and not you. What religion does, religion demotivates us. Religion says, I don't know, man. I mean, do you have the prayer cloth? I don't know. Have you touched the shroud of Turin? I don't know, man. Have you, have you prayed to the saint just right? I don't know, man. You better carry that guilt around just a little bit longer. Martin Luther was overwhelmed by guilt. He confessed every sin as a monk. Finally, the priest he kept confessing to said, Martin, stop confessing. You've run out of sins to confess. Luther finally figured out that in Christ, in Christ, he was right with God. He took off those monk clothes and put on the clothes of a regular man. He became a pastor. And praise God, he got married and found himself a wife. Can I get a hallelujah? Hallelujah. That's what the gospel does. The covenant of grace. Romans 8 tells us that nothing can separate you from the love of God. Nothing outside of you can separate you from the love of God. No judge, no condemner, no religion can look at you and say you're not right with God unless you don't believe in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, nobody can come to you and say you're not right with God. Nothing outside of you can separate you from the love of God in Christ. And beloved, nothing inside of you can separate you from the love of Christ. That's what Romans 8 says. How is that possible? Because God's promise of salvation is based on a covenant of grace, which is performed not by you, but by Jesus Christ. By Jesus Christ. Go to Christ in your weaknesses and with your sin, because he intercedes for you just like Moses does here. There's a great illustration. Um, I'll close with this. This couple gets married, and they're a young couple. They get married, and almost like a year or two within their early marriage, they go to church one day, and they hear the gospel, and they end up becoming Christians together. And it was this awesome thing that happened in their life. But with the preaching of the gospel, the young wife became convicted because she had a past that she had not told her husband when they were dating and when they were engaged. In particular, while they were engaged to be married, she had slept with another man. And she never told him, and he didn't know. And because of the gospel, she just felt like, I need to share this with my husband. i got to tell him what I've done. And so she sits down with him, and with tears falling out of her eyes, she says, I have to confess something. Why we were engaged, I, I slept with another man. Well, he immediately got up. He walked out of the house. She was like, it's over, man. It's like done. Like it's all over. And about a half hour later, he came back into the house and he had roses. And he brought them to her. And 
he said, we are in covenant together. And what I've learned from Jesus is that I'm forgiven and you're forgiven. And because of his covenant, he's called us into a marriage of covenant. And I promise, just like God has promised to me, I promise that I would be with you for the rest of my life. And I love you. And you are forgiven. And that is the power of the covenant of grace. That's what Jesus does for us, isn't it? We can confidently go to God with our weaknesses, our sins, our failures, and ask him to help us, knowing he will love us and help us in our times of need. Jesus is our intercessor. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our advocate. Let us not waste that by not going to him in our weaknesses and with our sins. Amen? Amen. We'll pick it up there next week. Let's pray.